This episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly is brought to you by Amazon Prime. Get 20% off and guaranteed release day delivery on all video game pre-orders, a free subscription to Twitch Prime, and access to thousands of movies and TV shows with the included Prime Video. Sign up now for a free 30-day trial subscription. On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, let's read Mega Play Issue 5 from July and August of 1991. Now, just to give you guys a little bit of context, this is the summer of 1991. So the Genesis has been out in North America for just shy of two years. And gamers are preparing for the imminent launch of the Super Nintendo, which happened, of course, in September of 91. So certainly at this point in time, it was important for Sega of America to really put their best foot forward uh, so as not to lose too much market share to Nintendo when the uh, Super Nintendo came out. This issue was bought at Electronics Boutique for $350 and uh, originally belonged to Dave, so thanks, Dave. Uh, obviously, the cover story is Streets of Rage, which I think is probably why people wanted me to look at this issue, and I don't blame them. And then you can see we've got the uh, first look at Golden Axe 2, as well as a preview of the Mega CD, which of course became the Sega CD uh, here. And then they say special 16-bit preview issue, but uh, I don't know what that really means. Now, opening it up, the first thing we see uh, here is an ad for Ballistic, which folds out. And I probably can't get it all on the screen at the same time, so we're just going to slide it over like this. Uh, Ballistic's kind of interesting. I don't really understand why they did this, but Ballistic was a publishing label created by Accolade for releasing their games on the Genesis. And I say I don't understand why they did that, only because Accolade was a company that had been around at this point for a long time. They were founded in 1984 and had produced a number of noteworthy games, mostly for home computer. So I don't really understand why they wouldn't want to capitalize on that by just sticking with the name that they were already using. And by 1993, they had gone back to publishing games on the Genesis uh, under the Accolade uh, name instead of Ballistic. All right, now on the next page, we've got the table of contents, which we won't bother with. And then over here, we've got an ad for Gyarus, which is often mispronounced as Gaia Res. Uh, the Gyarus uh, ads are probably most noteworthy for the fact that they have this guy here. This was Jamie Bunker, or uh, Jamie Bunker Professional Gamer. And uh, I believe that he was a game tester. You know, when you say professional gamer these days, it means something quite different. But uh, for some reason, they decided they were going to go ahead and kind of make him the spokesperson for uh, Gyarus here. And you can even see that if you buy the game, you can take home this T-shirt, which tells you uh, how to pronounce Gyarus. And uh, Gyarus has kind of become a bit of a cult classic. Uh, this was during a time, I would say 1990 and 1991, the market was really getting almost flooded with uh, shooters. It was probably a lot easier to develop a mediocre shooter than to develop a mediocre something else. And um, so that may explain why there were so many. Or it was just the fad at the time, because a lot of good shooters came out during this time. And uh, I would include Gyrus among them. It's sort of the hook that this game has, is that you have like this little helper ship that helps give you a little bit more firepower, but also you can send it out to attach to enemy ships and basically steal their weapons which is a, a pretty cool mechanic. Uh, unfortunately, the game has gotten a little bit expensive. I was just checking out eBay real quick, and, and you can easily spend over $100 if you want to get a, a complete copy, although, as is always the case with eBay, uh, with a little bit of patience, you can get a better deal. Uh, here we've got an ad for uh, Batman. Now, this is, of course, Batman for the Genesis, because if you'll recall, in the last episode of Let's Read, we talked about Batman for the NES. Now, uh, there, as I said, there were three Batman games all developed and published by Sunsoft, and all three of them were, were actually completely different games, like they were not ports of one another. Uh, this one suffered from maybe being a little bit too easy. You know, it sort of stayed fairly faithful to the movie and had some pretty sweet graphics. Uh, only interesting thing about Batman that I would say is that, uh, you know, as we already discussed, we're now in the summer of 1991, so you might reasonably be asking yourself, why is this game just now coming out when the movie came out in 1989? 
Now, Sunsoft had of course released Batman for the NES, and according to Nintendo's rules, once you did that, you could not release that game on another platform. So even though this is technically a completely different game, uh, they were prevented from releasing it on the Genesis. So this game actually came out on the Mega Drive in, I think, late 1990, but they couldn't bring it out here uh, at the same time for that reason. All right, on the next page, just got the masthead. And uh, I didn't mention Ed Semrad is actually the editor-in-chief. Uh, he's just talking here about uh, CD-ROM, you know, be, being the future and talking about, you know, the CD-ROM drive for the Turbo Graphics, which, of course, by this time had been out for quite some time. But people were pretty excited about the fact that a CD drive was coming out for the uh, Genesis. And he's talking about how it's going to be 370 bucks in Japan and, uh, you know, whatever. And then uh, over here, we've got this ad for Air Buster for the Genesis. And uh, this game came out as uh, Aero Blasters on the TurboGrafx-16. I've really never been able to get into this game. And this is just sort of an example of maybe what I was talking about before, where there was just so many shooters coming out. And uh, at least to me, this one didn't really have a whole lot going for it. Uh, but I will say, you'll notice you get a free video game glove with purchase. And, uh, you know, speaking as a gamer, I appreciate the fact you'll notice that the glove, your your thumb is completely encased. Your fingers, you've got some tactile, you know, feedback there or whatever, you know, or maybe to keep your hands cool. I don't really know. But, you know, just so you don't get uh, a blister on your thumb or whatever. You know, I always feel like you used to hear, you know, like, oh, thumb blistering action or whatever. I don't know about you, but I have never in my life gotten a blister from playing video games. I don't want to go so far as to say that video game gloves were a fad at that time, because I think uh, when you say something is a fad, you're implying a certain level of popularity. But uh, certainly it was something you could also buy separately. There was some company that, that sold video game gloves. At least during maybe the NES days when I was like 10 or 11 years old, if I had gone to the store and I was trying to decide between two games and all other things being equal, if one of them came with something like a video game glove, I probably would have gotten that one, so which is stupid, but that's the exact reason that they did it. Uh, here we've got an ad for PGA Tour Golf uh, from EA Sports, and I'm pretty sure I've mentioned these ads before. They these EA Sports ads really followed like a format that uh, I really like a lot personally. You can see they're kind of light on screenshots, and instead they're showing things like here's like the blueprints for a golf course and a scorecard and I, I think they're really trying to send home the point that this is more realistic and more immersive and uh, I really love this game a lot this the whole series on the Genesis is really good and I have all the games uh, with the exception of PGA Tour 96 that game sucks but uh, the first four games are all really good games and if you play this game you'll see that especially the menu system when you're setting your game up is very reminiscent of a computer game and at first I thought that they were just trying to do that to maybe appeal to people who were used to playing these types of games on computers, but this game was actually uh, developed for DOS PC. Uh, here we've got the first section of letters, bunch of letters here of people asking about the Mega CD and when is it going to come out. And and then just giving uh, just one response to the whole thing of, you know, here's when it's coming out and a little bit of details on it and, and whatever. One thing I always kind of noticed about letters uh, in EGM magazines, I know this isn't EGM, but, you know, it was published by the people who made EGM. They all seem to have the same voice. Now, I'm not suggesting that the letters are fake, but I... I think they might be heavily rewritten, which might make sense because, you know, you've got like 10, 11 and 12 year olds writing you letters. Uh, it's certainly possible that the grammar needs to be cleaned up. Uh, oh, yeah, this this is kind of interesting. Uh, I liked it anyway. So this guy, Mark Hancock, writes in when I hear your magazine and other magazines talk about game memory and system memory, I hear you use the word megabit. Don't you know that's wrong? Don't you know the term is actually megabyte? And I just like that because it reminds me so much of a lot of the comments that get left on my YouTube videos. And the only difference is I'll cut Mark a little bit of slack. 
because, you know, he was living in the pre-internet age where, you know, he didn't have an easy way of knowing he was wrong except going and looking up in a, in a book. But, you know, I, I get a lot of comments from people, you know, trying to correct me when they're just wrong and they could have taken two seconds to look it up. But, uh, I mean, I don't want to complain about that. I just, I just thought it was funny when I read that just because, you know, some things never change. Somebody in, in the middle of 1991 is still asking for more Sega Master System games. And, uh, you know, I understand if that's, you know, that's the horse that, that you've hitched your wagon to. But in 1991, I don't know how reasonable it is to really expect that many new Master System games to be coming out. Although there were some coming out, I think by this time, you really needed to be willing to import games from Europe. Uh, over here, we've got an ad for software, etc., with a $10 off coupon. That's a pretty good deal. Uh, by this time, the Genesis uh, list price had been dropped to $149. Remember that when it was launched, it was $189. But uh, by clipping at this coupon, you get it for $139, so that's pretty good. And uh, apparently, you could also get the uh, Game Gear for the same price. And I don't know what happened. I was working like odd jobs, like, you know, mowing lawns, raking leaves, whatever. And I saved up the money to get a Game Gear. And I had my grandma drive me down to, to the good guys. And they were out. Like, they were just sold out of Game Gears. And then I just never ended up getting one. Like, I don't know what happened. I don't know what I did with the money instead. I just never ended up getting a Game Gear. But not to dump on the Game Gear, I've never been a fan of it. And to be honest, when you read these, these magazines... You see the picture and you're like, man, that looks so sweet. But then you pick up a Game Gear and it's like, you know, it doesn't look anywhere near as good. Uh, here we've just got a preview article about the Mega CD. You can kind of see how, you know, it does look a little bit different, as you would expect, from the American Sega CD. Uh, just talking about, you know, it's it's got its own Motorola 68000 processor and how much RAM it's got in it. And just reiterating the price, you know, 370 in uh, Japan, I believe that the Sega CD ended up coming out here for two ninety nine, but uh, you know that wasn't until the following year. So by then, it may have may very well have been cheaper in Japan. Uh, here we've got uh, oh, I, so I have to mention this. So I I knew this when I bought these magazines, but the guy I bought these off of warned me that when he was a kid, he had uh, cut out some of the game tips. This is the only, it's only these two pages that have it, but uh, I know it, it looks kind of janky. But uh, here we've got some tricks for uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. Here was the level select trick. I think everybody knew about that one. And then I never knew about this. There's some sort of debug mode that you can enter. But at least according to this, you have to have like a, a revision one uh, version of Sonic the Hedgehog because they fixed this, you know, glitch or whatever it was. Here's an ad for uh, Electronic Gaming Monthly. Sendai Publications was like the parent company of EGM. So these are all Sendai Publications, uh, well, publications. And uh, so they're just trying to get you to subscribe to, you know, here's EGM. And the next page, here's Megaplay, which, of course, we're currently reading. And the next page, you've got uh, Computer Game Review and 16-Bit Entertainment. I have never personally seen an issue of this. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I'm just saying I've never come across one. Uh, I'm not really sure what they mean by that. It's computer games and 16-bit. I don't know if that means they're also covering, like, Genesis games in there, or are they talking about, like, 16-bit computers uh, like the Amiga? Not really sure. Uh, and then lastly, uh, again, I've never seen an issue of this. I, I know they do exist, and I would love to get my hands on a copy. Uh, Super Gaming, which just was basically covering the import scene. They were just talking about uh, Japanese games. So uh, going back a little bit. So now we're getting in uh, to the preview section. Now, there are a ton of previews in here. So I'm probably going to do quite a bit of editing here because some of them, uh, I don't think I have anything particularly interesting to say about them. And just to keep things moving along, if you see a lot of jump cuts uh, coming up in the next few minutes, it's just because I'm trying to sort of keep things rolling smoothly. Uh, down here, we've got Golden Axe 2, which uh, I think came out... I think it ended up coming out in December of this year. I've personally never been the hugest fan of Golden Axe 2. I am not saying it's a bad game, but I had Golden Axe, and that's one of my all-time favorite games. And there's just something about this game. It, it just seems like it has less personality. The level design doesn't seem as interesting, like the backgrounds and whatnot are not as interesting. And I feel like it kind of has weird graphics. It's almost like they they were almost going for some kind of like cell shaded look, but then not quite. 
just the way things are colored and everything just it doesn't look all that great and i think the animation is not as smooth but that's just my opinion it's not a bad game at all like golden axe 2 is a good game but i vastly prefer the uh, original golden axe uh, over here, we've got Toe Jam and Earl. Now, uh, I have to admit that I have never really played Toe Jam and Earl. I played it one time for like a few minutes, and uh, I'm just not sure what I'm supposed to do. And I think what will probably end up happening is at some point I'm going to do like an episode of the show where I'm going to have to cover Toe Jam and Earl, and then that will force me uh, to play the game, which I'm looking forward to because, you know, it, this is a very well-regarded game. I've just never really had a chance to get into it. Uh, this next game, Vapor Trail, is another shooter. Uh, this one is published by Renovation, but this was not a Telenet game. Like, Gyrus was actually developed by Telenet and released here by Renovation. Uh, Vapor Trail was actually made by Data East, and Data East themselves programmed the port, and it was just Renovation uh, that released it. It's, you know, it's a pretty average shooter. There's, it, there's nothing really remarkable about it. Um, but I, I, mean, I guess if you're looking for a new shooter to play, then, you know, have at it. Uh, here we've got uh, two Tengen games, Rampart and Road Blasters. Those are both uh, ports of Atari arcade games. I don't really have much experience with, with Rampart. Uh, it's sort of considered to be the grandfather of tower defense games, and it's a well-regarded game. I personally never ran across it in the arcades when I was a kid, but Road Blasters I definitely did. I remember playing this like in a movie theater lobby, and I think the best way to describe Road Blasters would be like if you took OutRun and like put guns on the Ferrari, you would have Road Blasters. Uh, so you're driving through the game, you have to pick up these green balls, which are just fuel, and, you know, then you're just shooting the other cars. And so, I mean, you know, when you're an 11 or 12 year old kid, that sounds awesome. Uh, and it is. And in the middle here, we have Mario Lemieux Ice Hockey. And I think it's either the August or September issue of Electronic Gaming Monthly. It was whichever issue was like the special collector's issue for the launch of the Super Nintendo. They actually reviewed NHL hockey in that issue. And one of the things that one of the reviewers said was that basically Sega shouldn't even bother releasing the, their own ice hockey game because NHL hockey was going to be so much better. And that definitely is the case. Um, Mario Lemieux kind of reminds me of Blades of Steel. Obviously, it has the same view, but also just kind of the way it plays, it reminds me of that game. But if you're an ice hockey fan and your choice was between this and NHL hockey by EA, it was like no competition. Uh, here we've got an ad by Sega. Uh, this is right in the middle of the magazine. Sega Does It All was actually one of their marketing slogans for a little while. If you can go watch, uh, there's some commercials on, on YouTube where that's, that's sort of what the uh, announcer or narrator says at the end. You know, instead of, maybe this was after they were done with Sega Does What, what Nintendo Don't. I'm not really sure. The guy at the end says, Sega Does It All. And, you know, that's just because, you know, as you see here, Here's our 16-bit system. Here's we're still doing our 8-bit system, and then we have this full-color handheld. But uh, you know, obviously, Nintendo was the more uh, popular line of products. Uh, over here, we have uh, now this is kind of interesting to have both of these here: uh, Outrun and Galaxy Force 2. There was a line of of arcade boards that were called Super Scalar boards, and there were four generations of these Super Scalar boards. And uh, as you might guess from the name, their strong suit was sprite scaling. And so like the first generation of Super Scalar uh, was Hang On. And then the second generation of the Super Scalar was the Outrun hardware. And uh, then there was a uh, third generation of the Super Scalar. And uh, that one had like Afterburner and uh, Thunderblade, Super Monaco GP. And then finally there was the fourth generation Super Scaler, and that one had Galaxy Force 2. So it's kind of interesting that both of these games are coming out on the Genesis at around the same time. The Genesis uh, didn't have too much trouble with a Super Scaler 2 game, Outrun, but if you check out Galaxy Force 2 on the Genesis, it's really not a very good home port, uh, I don't think.
it is a cool game. It's just the Genesis version is a little bit weak. And uh, what I will say, though, is if you want to check out a really cool version of Galaxy Force 2, if you own a Nintendo 3DS, check out the Sega Classics 3D version of this. Over here, we've got Double Dragon 2. Now, it did not make it out here uh, in this country on the Genesis, and they actually even predict it here. Uh, definitely a title worth looking for, as it probably won't make it out over here. Now, I agree with the second half of that, because it did, didn't make it out over here. But as far as it being worth looking for, uh, no, it's not. It's a good game in the arcade, obviously. It was released in this country on the NES, and I think that's a really cool game. I think it's better than the first Double Dragon uh, on the NES. And then this game was also released on the PC Engine Super CD, and that's also a, uh, a really cool version. But uh, uh, this one, no good. And I think that's probably why it didn't come out here, because, I mean, Double Dragon was a popular NES game, so why would you not release the sequel uh, on the Genesis, but uh, probably somebody played it and just said, uh, "Nah, -uh. like we don't, we don't really want that over here." Uh, and then down here we have this game, Undeadline, and uh, Undeadline uh, reminds me a lot of Nightmare on the MSX. If you've ever played that game, and I, I showed that game very briefly in the Sega Master System launch episode, uh, sort of during the Brazilian segment, and uh, this game very reminiscent of that. It, it's it's like a shooter game except you're just like a dude who's walking instead of, you know, being a spaceship or, or some kind of flying object. Undeadline actually did not come out here, unfortunately. It's too bad because I think it's actually a pretty cool game. Uh, but if you want to play something like Undeadline that did come out here on the Genesis, uh, check out Elemental Master because that's a pretty cool game. And then over here, you may not know it, but this is actually a pretty big deal. Super League 91. Now, we talked about the original Super League already on the launch of the Sega Genesis because that game was released here as Tommy Lasorda Baseball. And here we're talking about Super League 91. And um, they ended up adding a really awesome feature to this game. You had a game announcer announcing what was going on. And uh, which is weird because Super League 91 does not have that. So Sega of America, I guess, took this game and decided to add that feature to it and then of course released it in this country as Sports Talk Baseball which uh, at least according to many is one of the best baseball games if not the best baseball game uh, on the Genesis. Time to play ball. Los Angeles takes the field. Leading off number 51. Round ball to short. Picks it up and throws to first. Got him. He delivers. Long fly ball, deep to right, off the wall, pick it up, close to second, the runner goes back. Over here, we've got uh, Super Fantasy Zone. Uh, Super Fantasy Zone, unfortunately, was uh, not released here. I don't really understand uh, why. This was the third, it's basically Fantasy Zone 3. The main series is, of course, the uh, original Fantasy Zone, Fantasy Zone 2, The Tears of Opa Opa, and then uh, Super Fantasy Zone. Oddly, this game uh, was localized for the West, but then only released in Europe and not brought out here. I don't know if maybe Fantasy Zone wasn't that popular here. I really couldn't say. I think Fantasy Zone is an awesome game, so I'm not really sure why they chose not to release it here. So they, they talk about here uh, in this, this ad, you've got the MD adapter here. And hold on, I forgot. There was one other... Uh, letter that I wanted to talk about. Yeah, see, Mega Drive Converter. Somebody writes in and is asking about uh, Mega Drive Converters because he wants to play Mega Drive games, so he wants to import Japanese games and play them on his on his Genesis. And uh, he's asking about the converters or or a technique called shaving. But he's saying, well, the extender boards are expensive, and but they are convenient, but they're really not that expensive. It's twenty four dollars regular price, eighteen dollars if you buy it like with a Mega Drive game. Um, oh, hold on. Uh, and then just for fun, like here, here's what he's talking about. Like this would be, uh, like this is the Honey Bee. And is that gonna focus if I move up Honey Bee uh, converter? And so this was meant to just like, this would just sit 
in your Genesis, and then you could go ahead and snap a uh, Mega Drive cartridge on top. So, like, I would rather spend, uh, you know, 18 or $25 or whatever on one of these rather than, you know, taking a file and, you know, grinding down my Genesis. So I don't know about you, but personally, I would much rather uh, just have one of these. All right, moving on. Uh, here we've got uh, Growl. Uh, Growl is like a not very well regarded, uh, I guess you call it. Yeah, it's a beat em up game. I think it's pretty cool. I mean, it's not, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's not that great of a game, but there's, it's got like some character to it. I don't know how else to put it. Like if you play that game, you're going, man, this game isn't really that good, but I like it anyway. So maybe like the word for that is like campy. Like, you know how sometimes there's like movies that are so bad, they're good. That's kind of the case with this. There's just something about the game that I think is pretty cool. I don't know. It's just a cool game. Like, it, I guess it it appeals to the 12-year-old in me or something. I'm not really sure. All right, now we're kind of getting into uh, the meat and potatoes uh, of this issue. Now we're getting into, like, the deep dive uh, previews. These are still previews. And uh, the first one, of course, is for Streets of Rage. And, you know, I what can you even really say about this game? Uh, I, I love this game. Now, I did play Streets of Rage 2 first. And then I had to go back and play this game. So it, it was kind of a little bit of a letdown for me, only because Streets of Rage 2 is so much better. But if you go play other beat-em-up games from the same time and earlier, so 91 or earlier, Streets of Rage is so much better than pretty much all of them. Like, the only one that really holds a candle to it is Final Fight. Like, I know that's like a big... That's always been a big debate, you know, Streets of Rage or Final Fight. And it's a good question because they're both really good games. In my opinion, Streets of Rage 2 is much better than either one of them. But, um, I mean, what a game. You know, I already obviously covered this extensively on my show. I think that was episode 10. Uh, I kind of wish I'd waited to do that because I think I would do a much better job uh, if I did it now. But um, awesome game. This kind of has the feel of Die Hard Game Fan to me, just this little section, because there's so many screenshots. And I know I mentioned this in a previous episode. I can't remember what issue it was, but I remember it was Sonic the Hedgehog 2. And I was kind of mentioning that I felt like they were spoiling the game by showing so many screenshots, and certainly that is the case again here. Um, they're showing almost the entirety of at least the beginning of level one. But then you turn the page, and they're showing you every other level. So they're really not leaving anything for you to discover, you know, which I think is kind of a shame. But, uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter because with a game like this, you know, you can you can read this and it, it's it's nothing like playing the game and experiencing it for yourself. Uh, still to this day, in my opinion, one of the absolute best video game soundtracks of all time, of course, by the legendary Yuzo Koshiro. Uh, next, we've got Mercs. Now, uh, Mercs was the sequel to Commando. Now, Commando was a Capcom arcade game that was ported to the NES along with a litany of other systems. Now, in Japan, these games were called, I think, Wolf of the Battlefield. And so Commando was Wolf of the Battlefield, and then and then Mercs was Wolf of the Battlefield too. So I don't really understand. Well, first of all, they should have stuck with that because that's awesome. But if they weren't going to, if you're going to call the first one Commando, I don't know why they didn't just call this Commando 2. Definitely a cool game. Uh, it's very, uh, very, very similar to Shock Troopers on the, on the Neo Geo. Now, of course, that game didn't come out until the late 90s, so it's not like Mercs was ripping them off. I mean, probably much the opposite. But uh, if you like this kind of game, you know, these top-down, uh, vertically scrolling run-and-gun games, you know, similar to like Akari Warriors or, like I said, uh, Shock Troopers or uh, Rambo 3... Definitely really cool games. Now, here's the problem with Mercs, and I really don't understand this. Games like this are fun, particularly when they're played two-player, because they're, they're two-player simultaneous. And for some reason, they took out the ability to play this game two-player. Uh, you know, maybe it's a limitation of the Genesis hardware. I'm really not sure, because, you know, the aforementioned Rambo 3 also didn't have uh, two-player simultaneous and um, I had assumed that that was just because, it, you know, who was going to be the second player? I mean, Rambo was like the lone wolf, so who was going to be player number two? Uh, it's still a cool game, and you should check it out. 
Next we have Turrican. And uh, this is actually a game that I had back in the day. And uh, just as a little bit of background, Turrican was originally developed for the Commodore 64 back in 1990 and was a game that really pushed the limits of the hardware and uh, was so impressive that it was basically immediately brought over to the Amiga and, uh, you know, where it had an awesome soundtrack. It's kind of weird, like the, the Commodore 64 game has very little music, like some of the stages have music, some of the stages don't have music. And then when they brought it over to the Amiga, they got this composer named Chris Hulesbeck to write the soundtrack for Turrican. And it's just one of the most legendary game soundtracks uh, of all time. I've always liked this game. Now this game, uh, you know, the Amiga port is probably the definitive version of the game. But speaking in terms of like, you know, video game consoles, uh, this game came out on the Genesis and Mega Drive. Uh, came out on the TurboGrafx-16, I have that version as well, and believe it or not, came out on the Game Boy. And I always liked the game. And I feel like I read a lot of negative reviews and negative comments about this game, mostly from North American gamers. This is a game that's very well regarded, from what I've seen, by European gamers. This is a European game, I mean, it was, it was developed in Europe, and was sort of made for the European audience where the Commodore 64 and the Amiga were very, very popular. And I just think it's got more of a European style of gameplay when it comes to these uh, side-scrolling action platformers. Whereas I think in this country, people were more accustomed to like Japanese style run and gun games, which tended to be faster paced. You have to take your time. You have to play very defensively. I would implore anybody who has a negative opinion of this game to please try it again, but take into consideration what I said, which is like slow down and don't think you're going to run through the level because if you do, you're just going to get killed. But if you can manage to not do that, I think you'll have a good time. Uh, on the next page here, we have NHL Hockey. And I wanted to use this as a springboard to talk about electronic arts and their position in the industry as this sports powerhouse. Because I really feel like this is something that started in 1991. Their first sports game, at least that I could think of, was, and I'm not including zany golf when I say that, uh, they had Madden, you know, the original John Madden football was released in the Genesis in late 1990, like November of 1990. And I mean, that's really what you have to say, that's what got it started. EA as the sports powerhouse. But in 1991, you had PGA Tour Golf, you had Lakers versus Celtics in the NBA playoffs, and you had NHL hockey. At this point, therefore, they had, you know, four of the major sports covered. And with most of these games, I'm not saying they knocked it out of the park straight out of the gate, but uh, NHL hockey, man. Like, you know, when people think of hockey on the Genesis, they of course think of NHL 94, which was the third installment in the series. But it all got started with this game. And, and this is a series that is still going on to this day. 20, what is this, 26 years later, we EA still has their NHL hockey franchise. And that started with this original game. And if you play NHL, uh, NHL PA hockey was the one that came out after. That's like NHL 93, if you want to call it that. This would be kind of like NHL 92, except it's just called NHL hockey. And then, of course, NHL 94 was the third iteration. The games are all very similar. They're just like each one was like an incremental improvement or, or evolvement over the previous game. Is that a word, evolvement? Evolution. That's the word I was looking for. So this game to me is great, great fun. And if 40-year-old me was living in 1991 instead of now, I guarantee you I would have bought this game on day one. Uh, just as a hockey fan and sort of a closeted sports gamer, uh, but just a lover of video games, I would have grabbed this. Now this game to me is fun to play now. I mean, all these old games are fun to play now. Just because something about it, it just oozes like early 90s hockey. And you know, I, I did that episode, uh, the history of NHL 94, and I really partially did that as a love letter 
to like old school hockey. And, uh, you know, a lot of that is embodied in this game. So I just love this game. I love playing it and playing as the teams that don't exist anymore. Like here you've got the Hartford Whalers, uh, the Minnesota North Stars. Uh, there's the New Jersey Devils with their old color scheme, the Quebec Nordiques. The two negatives I would say about this game, no one-time shot, and you can't play a complete season. So here you can play just a single game, or you can play a complete set of the playoffs. So that's kind of cool. Even without those features, it's I think it's awesome. You could, of course, uh, fight in this game, which uh, pissed off the league. Uh, as I mentioned in my NHL 94 video, uh, somehow the league didn't know there was going to be fighting in this game. Uh, they wanted it removed, but it was like too late because the cartridges were being manufactured. And uh, as a result, EA did not have an NHL, ni uh, NHL license for the subsequent edition of the game, which was NHL PA Hockey. You know, if you're a hockey fan, honestly, it's worth going back and playing all three of those games uh, just to see the evolution. Once you get to NHL 95, uh, I, I don't like the games as much uh, anymore. Uh, here we've got, uh, here's Decap Attack. I have never played this game, so I'm kind of not going to comment on it just because I don't think I have anything intelligent to say about it. Uh, it's an action platform game. You play a sort of a mummified zombie with no head. I did want to mention, though, now over here is another renovation ad. Uh, this is for Arcus Odyssey. But again, they have uh, basically one of their employees uh, standing in as a spokesman. This is David. I don't know how to say his name. David Izad or Izad. I don't know how to say his name. But you, know, you can see he's got his San Jose State University sweatshirt on. So you can imagine this is probably a college job that he had uh, just doing game testing and whatnot. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. You know, I would love to have had, you know, been able to do something like this when I was younger. But uh, I just thought that was fun to point out. All right. So here we've got Zero Wing. Now, uh, so it's another shooter. Uh, this is a Toa Plan shooter. I hope I'm saying that right. Toa Plan. Who uh, also made uh, the Truxton series, Fire Shark, uh, Tiger Heli. Uh, the other game I can think of that they did for the Mega Drive was Hellfire. Uh, and that one was also uh, horizontally scrolling. I feel like most Toa Plan shooters are vertically scrolling. Uh, Zero Wing obviously is famous for the, uh, you know, all your base are belong to us thing that was popular. I don't know how long ago that was, at least 10 years ago, I feel, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, Zero Wing is actually, in my opinion, a decent game. It's, it's a pretty good shooter. You could make the argument that, you know, in a sea of shooter games during the 16-bit era, is Zero Wing really famous, you know, because of the internet meme? Or is that meme sort of upstaging a good game? And I would say the latter. I would say that I think Zero Wing is a good game. It's definitely worth playing. Unfortunately, the game was not released in North America. Uh, it came out in Japan, obviously, and then was localized for the West and released in Europe. So when you see the, you know, the all your base or belong to us cutscenes, that's from the European release of the game. Didn't come out here, uh, unfortunately. The game was also released on the PC Engine CD. I can't remember if it's a Super CD or not. Uh, now we get into the reviews. They actually don't have that many reviews in here, uh, oddly, just because this was the 16-bit preview issue. Uh, they've got a uh, review of Sonic the Hedgehog. Now, Sonic the Hedgehog came out in June of 91, and you see it gets two eights and nine and a ten. And really, if you read the two uh, reviewers that gave it an 8, uh, they're basically complaining the game is too short and too easy, which is a, a very fair uh, criticism, in my opinion. Otherwise, it's an awesome game. They all praise it. It's just like, well, it'd be nice if it was a little bit harder or longer, which is absolutely true. Uh, Streets of Rage gets 9s across the board. Uh, nobody has anything critical to say about it. Uh, I don't know what it was about it that didn't deserve a 10, but uh, that's just being greedy. Up here, we've got Batman. Uh, everybody agrees that it's a good game, but they all say that the game is too easy. Uh, down here, you've got Alien Storm. This was a Sega-developed beat-em-up game. It was originally a, a Sega arcade game. I think it was made by Sega AM1, if I remember correctly. And then this was the uh, a Genesis port of that. Uh, not really that great of a game, but it's not horrible. I feel like giving it a 5 is being a bit heavy-handed. Uh, I would just call the game very average. 
And, you know, somebody might say, well, wait a minute, you know, this is a, these reviews are out of 10, so a 5 is average. But, you know, if you read video game magazines, a 5 is not an average, really a 7 is. If something doesn't get at least a 7, that always to me means stay away. I haven't pulled this out yet in this, in this episode, so let me just say, Alien Storm would be a good weekend rental. Down here we've got Hardball. You can see that Hardball was a very polarizing game. Gets two eights, but then gets a three and a four. Now, I think the truth there is maybe somewhere in the middle or maybe goes more towards the three and the four. Uh, as I said, when this game came out, it was only the third baseball game for the Genesis. And in my opinion, it was the weakest of the three. Now what it had going for it is it had that behind the pitcher view that was probably you know, it's funny because I want to say that was made famous by Bases Loaded, but really Hardball predates uh, Bases Loaded on home computer systems. It has that, which is more realistic. That's pretty cool. But uh, the one thing I wanted to say, this is the kind of thing that maybe annoys me a little bit, is that Bart here says, there are only a few sports games that I like, and this isn't one of them. Now, if you're not a sports gamer, you shouldn't be reviewing a sports game. Because if you're not a sports gamer, you're not going to buy a sports game. And so if you don't like sports games, I kind of don't care what your opinion is uh, of a sports game, if that makes sense. Uh, next page, you've got Pac-Mania, whatever. Uh, Super Volleyball. Uh, Super Volleyball came out on the Genesis and the PC Engine. And uh, its sequel came out on the Neo Geo. Uh, to be honest, I always kind of thought it was a cool game. You know, it's not going to win any awards, but, you know, I could spend a couple hours sitting there playing it. I don't know what it is about it. I'm not saying it's great. Uh, down here you see Turrican. Obviously, we've already extensively talked about that. Uh, gets three nines and a seven. So, as I said, back then they liked it. Up here you've got Fantasia. Now, that's a little bit interesting. Castle of Illusion came out on the Genesis in late 1990 and is a very well-regarded game. Fantasia is the follow-up to that game and um, was definitely a highly anticipated game. And if you go on Usenet and you read people's comments, everyone is saying, stay away from this game. This is not like Castle of Illusion, which is too bad uh, that, that they managed to take a good game and screw it up. Now, this game does have very cool graphics and sounds, but the animation is terrible, uh, ironically. Here you've got NHL Hockey. They gave it eights across the board. Uh, we already talked about that. Miss Pac-Man, here's another example. Miss Pac-Man for the Genesis. You've got someone over here saying, not being a fan of Miss Pac-Man in the arcades, I knew I wasn't going to like it. Well, then why are you reviewing it? If you're going to have like preconceived notions about it, the other guys gave it sevens. Uh, here you've just got this uh, game over. I don't, I don't know why they do this. I kind of don't like it. This is basically showing you the ending to Michael Jackson's Moonwalker. So like, I don't know if it's like, well, you're never going to beat this game. So here's the ending spoiled for you. Uh, so I don't really care for the fact that they did that. Uh, and then over here, this is just an ad. Are you a Genesis genius? It's just trying to get you to read about a bunch of EA sports games. So, you know, whatever. Uh, and then back here on the back cover, you've got Bimini Run. Hopefully I'm saying that right, Bimini Run. Uh, I think this is a pretty cool game, personally. You're driving a motorboat. It's got some uh, really cool graphical effects to it. It's got neat parallax scrolling with the waves. It was made by this company called New Vision Entertainment, which I don't really know what their story is. This is the only game that they ever developed. Uh, as far as I know, for any platform, but certainly for the Genesis, they had three other games in development that uh, just never came out. But uh, it was a game that I had never heard of until I read about it on the Video Game Critics website. And I checked it out. Uh, again, I would say it falls into weekend rental territory. But, you know, if you want to drive a boat and, and shoot stuff, uh, it's a pretty cool game in my opinion. So uh, worth checking out. So that is going to do it for Mega Play issue number five from July and August of 1991.